consultancy, we think that sounds basically the economic consultancy, but opinions can differ on this. Um, and we're very delighted to be, um, to be sponsoring this event. Before I get started, I should just um, declare a couple of interests. So I've previously advised Spotify on some issues related to what I'm going to talk about, and I'm currently advising Google in, in this space as well. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Well, market and regulatory failures. Normally, when I talk about these issues, um, there's very widespread exception, uh, um, acceptance of the idea, yes, market failures are common. Of course, you know, there's all sorts of problems in this market. Oh, but regulatory failures, no, we can't possibly think about those. I suspect the balance in this audience might be different, so that'll be interesting. We'll see how, how that goes. But I am going to argue that market failures are common in digital markets, and market failures in the sense that I think a layperson would understand them rather than an economist's sense of, oh, it doesn't match some ideal perfect market, so therefore it's a problem, because actually that ideal perfect market never exists. However, the layperson understanding of, of market failures does, I think. If you need me to move around, I can. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, and, uh, so uh, I, I do think intervention and substantial intervention in this space is inevitable. Um, yeah, whether we like it or not, I suspect a lot of the audience won't like it. I do think at least in principle, that's probably desirable. But we do need to be alive to those regulatory failures. And I'll talk about some of the ways that they can possibly be mitigated. Um, because I'm here and because, well, this is partly a, a sort of a celebration of an anniversary of, of Hayek's famous um, work in this space, I do think Hayek's insights about the, the benefits of decentralized approaches remain particularly relevant. And I'll, I'll say just a bit about that at the end. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so this is a very busy slide, so I won't really talk about this, but um, and sorry, I've moved away from the camera. No, no, this is fine. <laughs> fine. Um, I, I am going to talk mostly about market power in the market failure space, but there are a bunch of other potential market failures you might think about. I think I, I'd say um, the one I list at the bottom, uh, the sense of behavioural biases, bounded rationality issues, I think is particularly relevant potentially, and it relates a bit to um, some of the, I think, some of the questions or issues about why is some of this pop popular? Why is intervention potentially popular here? I think social media, frankly, lots of people use it, I use it, and use it, but hate it. And that is an issue, right? This is why you can have popular intervention, because people that do feel addicted to things like Facebook feel addicted to things like Twitter, and so therefore might support intervention politically even to um, constrain a good that they use very intensively put individually. So there, there are potential issues here, I think, um, you know, again, whether we like it or not. But I'll talk more about the market power uh, questions here and, and some of the issues such as network effects and, and switching costs, which are, I, I think are on the next slide. Um, and if we, uh, sorry, I, th I think, is there any way I can click through? Because I've got, I've stupidly clicked, click, click, if you can click through the whole slide, that'd be good, yeah, thank you. Um, there we go. So there are very large network effects in, in these markets. Having a large number of users, of course, encourages other people to be on those platforms. And I think um, Mark mentioned the, the Friends Reunited example. Friends Reunited topped out in the UK at about 3 million monthly users, right? Facebook is probably 40, 45, 50 million monthly users. So at the time when Friends Reunited was there, of course there were network effects, but there's also a very large untapped market for social media. That's not obviously the case anymore. The example I've got here is about um, the um, information that Google gets versus Bing. So very nice work by the Competition and Markets Authority, which shows that Google essentially receives much more of those very rare searches. So, you know, not just searching for cute cats, but searching for cute cats balanced on the top of the Empire State Building on one leg or something mm -hmm. like this. They see those searches and so are able to provide really excellent results to those kinds of searches in a way that Bing doesn't. So there are significant barriers to entry to Bing relative to Google. Now that's not to deny, of course, that you know, Google might well be superior to Bing as well, but whether or not it's superior, the network effects mean it has a significant inbuilt advantage. Um, and then if we can go to the next slide, please. And again, maybe click through, thank you. 
Secondly, there are significant switching costs in this market. Now, I'm not sure. Network effects, I think, are something that's quite new in the digital space, or at least the scale of them is quite unusual in the digital space. Switching costs are not perhaps particularly unusual, but they can be quite large. And um, this is what's billed as a, a simple step-by-step -step guide to get iMessages on, um, on Android phones. So if you have iMessages on iOS, you want to switch between an iPhone and Android. How do you do it? Well, if you Google, you can find a, a nice simple step-by-step -step guide. That simple step-by-step -step guide says, OK, you need to install the server. You need to open the server application. You need to adjust your sleep settings. You need to enable port forwarding, install the app, open the app, send your first, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is doable, of course, but it's not simple. And it's the kind of thing that is, in practice, I think, a quite a significant barrier to, to switching between the, those ecosystems. Uh, so again, we can click through. And third, I think there are issues of leveraging of market power. There is scope for these digital platforms to leverage their market power into new markets. And so this is work by my colleagues, Daniele Condorelli and Jorge Padilla, who've looked at how um, uh, data advantages in one market can then be um, leveraged to expand into an adjacent market. So uniting data sets to create market power elsewhere as well. Work by me, along with Jorge and, and Salvatore Piccolo, looking at how you can use self-preferencing as, let's say, Apple controlling an app store, how can you preference your own apps to try to leverage market power into, um, into other markets to gain power in, in the app market as well? And what we've seen, and again, this is not at all unique, um, but we've seen with Apple that it's moved quite significantly away from being essentially a device seller to being, a, yes, mostly a device seller, but with a very large and very profitable services business as well. And that's the growth of the App Store in, in, in particular. A quote from Steve Jobs when the App Store was set up, saying we don't intend to make any money off the App Store. Well, now they're making about $50 billion a year. And that's with the profit, that's the revenues and, and the profit margin, as far as we can tell, maybe 60, 70 percent. So there's very significant um, uh, profits coming from that, that leveraging market power. OK, if we can go through to the next slide. This, I think, it's become a very sexy issue, which is why I've got it here. I think quantitatively it's a less important issue, which is the question of killer acquisitions and what's called the kill zone. So this sense that um, startups might find it hard to offer products in markets that are, that are entered or, or um, offered by dominant platforms. And secondly, the idea of killer acquisitions. So the idea that companies are buying up other other companies buying up startups in order to shut them down um, and preempt future competition. As I say, I think there's actually fairly limited evidence of this. I think if you just click through one, you will see a slide on this. But there is some suggestive analysis of, of digital market impact so far. You almost certainly can't see this, I'm afraid. But um, the blue line here is Facebook and Google acquisitions and what happens after, let's say, after Facebook buys Instagram. Are there many deals? Is there much investment in? picture messaging sites, well, hey presto, there isn't. You know, Facebook has bought Instagram, why would anyone else invest in, in those sorts of products? Is at least the argument with some evidence behind it. So I think there are market failure issues here. We can discuss these in more depth, but I, I think on both the economist's definition, which is, I think, idealized, but also on the layperson's definition, there are potential issues that could warrant intervention in, in digital markets. Um, but if we go through to the next slide, regulatory failures are also common. And I think they're probably particularly common in digital markets, partly because of the novelty, partly because of maybe a range of vested interests, partly because of lots of political interests as well, the US and European divides there, for instance, which mean that there are many important regulatory failures here. And I'll say a bit more about, um, about a few of these in a moment. <coughs> but these can include bureaucratic inertia and conservatism, inadequate powers for the desired role, and principal agent problems. There's a nice quote from, from James Forder, who's a, um, coming as director of research here, about central banks. Central banks are primarily interested in maintaining their independence, maximizing their discretion, and avoiding blame for poor outcomes. Obviously, he's talking about central banks, but I think regulators have a very similar dynamic as well. This is not, um, not at all unique to them. And of course, there are also questions, uh, I think, came up in the question just now about regulators furthering the interests of firms rather than consumers. 
but also furthering political interests rather than consumers, so being dominated by particular political demands. Uh, I'll give a few examples, you know, question whether they fit exactly, but certainly in this space around digital mergers, GDPR, and um, in, from my um, personal history of um, at Ofgem um, retail reforms. So if we click through, so yeah, digital mergers. Um, there's a lot of talk now about authorities needing more power to block mergers and this sense that, oh well, if only we were allowed to block mergers um, more easily, if we, if we did, weren't, if we weren't be able to be appealed effectively, for instance, if we um, had a somewhat different standard of proof, well, we could block these mergers and, and everything would be fantastic. The CMA and other authorities, of course, have very long had powers to block mergers. In the digital space, they just haven't used them. You can argue whether that's right or wrong, but they have not used them. And not only have they not used them, but in fact, they haven't analysed the issues correctly on the whole. So it's a very good evaluation that the CMA commissioned from LEAR of, of how they had looked previously at digital mergers, and they'd missed out lots and lots of issues in digital markets. Some of them issues about which suggested that the mergers were going to be anti-competitive, so evidence of potential competition from things like Instagram to Facebook, but also some of them evidence that mergers were going to be pro-competitive. <coughs> there is, I think, good evidence that these mergers had significant efficiencies associated with them and therefore significant consumer benefits. Both of those were missed out by, um, by the authorities. CMA definitely not alone in this. None of the authorities have looked at these mergers in any particular depth. Very large numbers of mergers and acquisitions by GAFAM, uh, a rather um, perhaps histrionic statement, but you know there's some logic in it by Tommaso Valletti, the, um, the former chief economist at DG Comp, saying the GAFAM have acquired more than a thousand firms in the past 20 years. That's probably not quite true, but it's a, an understandable exaggeration. And zero of those transactions have been blocked. These are extreme, ridiculous numbers. Now, I think that's a somewhat false way of looking at the world because a lot of these transactions are what's called acqui hires. So you're essentially buying a very small company in order to um, you know, basically hire the founders. But nonetheless, this includes, of course, some very big transactions like Google, um, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, other, other ones, at least a priori, might seem to be anti-competitive. OK, so moving on to GDPR, which I think is probably the biggest single regulatory intervention in the digital space that we've, we've seen so far. Um, I think, personally, it's probably been disastrous. And it's a, sh it's a shame that Michael had to go, because you know, I, I have no skin in the game on the privacy sandbox case. I haven't been involved. I haven't even looked at it that closely. But it does seem a bit odd that you are pursuing a company on you know, grounds of its pursuing privacy and harming competition when you've just introduced a regulation that explicitly harms competition on the grounds of promoting privacy. Um, so a stated aim of GDPR is to protect rights and freedoms of natural persons, in particular the right to the protection of, of personal data, but it almost certainly restricts competition. It makes it harder to share data outside large platforms. It sort of entrenches the market power of those, of those large platforms. The CMA itself has said this. It makes gaining and managing consent within a walled garden much easier than, than sharing data between undertakings, so it privileges those, those larger firms. And there's some evidence of this from the academic literature as well. The market concentration has increased as a result of the implementation of GDPR. And of course, there are examples in the, in the sort of um, more popular press, I suppose, about the at least claims that um, Google and others have used GDPR to, um, to accentuate their position. Um, so maybe you should click through again. So whenever I raise these issues, I get told, well, you economists, all you care about is competition. GDPR isn't about competition, it's about privacy. You should care about privacy, and so don't worry about competition. OK, so let's see how well it's performed in, in, on privacy grounds. And on first grounds, uh, at the first look, we see the European Com Commission has done an evaluation of GDPR. Great. I love evaluations. Fantastic. And OK, GDPR has met most of its objectives. It's offered citizens a strong set of enforceable rights. It's created a new European system of government, governance and enforcement. But when you look down into this, you see, OK, 
what this means is that 69% of people have heard about GDPR. OK, fine, I guess that's good, but it doesn't get me too excited. We learn that data protection authorities are working together in the context of the European Data Protection Board. Great, good for them. I'm very happy that they're presumably having nice meetings and, and great. And then the killer fact here, well, there's been a 42% increase in staff and a 49% increase in budget of national data protection authorities in three years. So we should really celebrate. Clearly, this has been incredibly successful so far, right? No mention at all of the impact on consumers. No mention at all of the impact or on the people this is supposed to be protecting. And if you look at less biased assessments, if we go through to the next slide, you see quite a different picture, right? So we learned from an Ofcom survey that 70% of internet users say that they usually accept terms and conditions online without reading them, which of course gives us useful evidence that 30% of people lie to Ofcom surveys. <laughs> um, and we see very good evidence from um, the CMA, which went through some of these terms and conditions statements. So what are people actually signing up to? Well, each time they click on something like this sign up button here, they're signing up to 10,000 words of information. With very and, and very difficult information as well, stuff that's that's not that's written in tr technical jargon. It's not designed to be understood. It's not designed to be read. And this, you know, these are five examples. But this happens all the time. You know, everything you click on, there's ten thousand words behind it that you are clicking, you are signing up to um, when when you click on something. <coughs> and if we go through to the next slide. Again, this has been backed up by the academic studies we've seen so far. So we see some evidence that GDPR has led to a reduction in cookies, but meant that the remaining customers were more persistently trackable. And the, this is a kind of early conclusion on the effect. The current eco ecosystem of mechanisms to prompt for user consent provides no real improvement for user privacy compared to pre-GDPR times. So we've been through all of this. We've had everybody whacking a mole every time they try and click on any, any website. Um, have these impacts on competition, these sort of negative effects, with no benefit. As far as we can see, no benefit whatsoever to consumers. Now, that might be just slightly overplayed, actually, in my, in my judgment. I think there might be some benefit. Those people who are really engaged with the process might be getting some benefits from it. But the overall effects are, are pretty small, it, um, even if they are some, some positive ones. OK, so finally, I just want to, I suppose, delve into my, my personal history a little bit. So this is outside the tech space, but I think it's very relevant to thinking about how regulation will work in practice and relevant to, I think, Sam's question about, about regulatory capture and how it, how it actually operates in practice. So this is um, a decade or so ago. The GB Energy Regulator launched the Retail Market Review. It worried that the energy market wasn't working efficiently. Hey, presto, the energy market still isn't working efficiently, but at least it was, it was worried about it then. And it implemented a range of changes. So it limited the number of tariffs that energy firms could offer. It made, the, it made discounts simplified. It did all kinds of interventions to try to essentially simplify the retail market, was how it thought about it. A few years later, the CMA came along and found that actually the effect of all of these rules was to weaken competition among the suppliers. That the RMR rule limited the ability of suppliers to compete and innovate in a way that was beneficial to customers and competition. That the rules dampened price competition, limiting the ability and incentives of suppliers to respond to it to competition by offering cheaper tariffs or discounts. So this is quite, in, in a way, I think, quite a remarkable result that the competition authority was saying that a regulator with a competition duty had intervened in ways that made competition worse. It had an adverse effect on competition. And that, you know, I'm, I'm picking on my old employer, but actually, again, these sorts of dynamics are not particularly unique. Th these happen elsewhere as well. And I should say, a reason it's my, my personal history, the reason I became chief economist at Ofgem was because um, one of the CMA's recommendations was you need more internal challenge, and so you need an officer of the chief economist. So that's, that's how I ended up there. Um, OK. So what do we do with all this? Um, so I think there's a, there's a couple of, I don't know whether you'd call them extreme in this context, it's perhaps not, but a couple of um, what I, perhaps extreme solutions. One is you've got Charybdis, the whir whirlpool on the left-hand side, saying this is all just a natural monopoly, right? Don't bother trying for competition. Don't bother trying for any funky solutions. It's a natural monopoly, regulated accordingly. We know how to do that. On the other side, you've got Asilla, which says that 
Regulators are doomed to fail, at least as much as markets. So just don't intervene, just don't do anything in this sort of space. And I think, frankly, both of those have good arguments in their favour, and we might end up in one of them. Um, perhaps some combination of two of them, and hey, maybe we will. I suspect in this room we'd, we'd probably steer more to the right here. But I do think the prize of competitive markets, and I don't think we have really competitive markets in a lot of the, the digital space at the moment, the prize of competitive markets is so large that we shouldn't give up yet. But if we are to get there, we need to pay more attention to regulatory and institutional design than has happened so far. And I've got just a few thoughts on, on what that might look like. So, just like market failure, regulatory failure can't be eliminated, but it can be mitigated. Um, a big part of that is strong challenge processes. That means internal to the bodies, things like panel systems, things like offices of the chief economist, but even more so it's external to the, uh, the authorities. That means strong appeals mechanisms, and I'm worried that some of the proposals seem to, um, seem to be to downplay the, the appeal mechanisms that are currently in place. It also means actually symmetric appeals mechanisms, so making it easier for consumer groups, for people on all sides of the, you know, uh, of, um, of the issues, are able to appeal, are able to challenge decisions. That's a very good way of limiting regulatory capture in this space. <coughs> Second, greater use of independent evaluation of decisions to learn what works and what doesn't. Um, very motherhood and apple pie, but it, it basically never happens in practice. You've got one or two examples like that Lear evaluation, but there's very, very few of them. Third, reduction of various forms of capture. That means partly the regulatory, ca the capture by firms, regulated firms, and working on things like revolving doors. I think there's still a, a lot of that in place in, in regulators. But it actually also means political capture. And at the moment, there's a lot of, um, or rather there's proposals that the CMA, that government will be able to give a strategic steer to the CMA essentially whenever it wants. So whenever there's a media scandal, whenever there's some sort of storm that a politician cares about, they can just say, CMA, we want you to change your priorities. This, I think, is very harmful and hasn't been, uh, hasn't been sufficiently um, picked up on so far, I think. And finally, of course, realism about what regulation can and can't achieve. It's there to prevent the worst problems. It's not there to lead us to the promised land. And I think there is an issue that regulators get bigger and bigger, and they think, well, there are problems out there. There are things we should do. Yes, something must be done. This is something, therefore, we must do it. And I think this is a, a, a sort of problematic dynamic in this space. So finally, I said I'd leave with Hayek. I actually leave with two quotes. This, one is from a, a guy called Daniel Gabriel Wyatt, who I don't know at all, um, but who um, uh, put in a submission to the mobile ecosystem study, the, the market study that the CMA is currently carrying out, where he said, I, I, I find it odd that you only have a questionnaire for developers. I think it's just as important, if not more so, to have views of the citizenry. I've noticed a worrying trend in many of these cases in that regulators are purportedly acting on behalf of consumers but there is never any real consultation of their wishes or views. I think there is a real issue there that regulators talk to each other, right? They talk to each other, they talk to government, they talk to firms. They don't really have a sense of, of what consumers want. And then finally, Hayek himself. So if we can agree that the economic problem of society is mainly one of rap rapid adaptation to changes in the particular circumstance of time and place, I think that's increasingly so in digital markets, much more so in digital markets than the markets that Hayek was thinking about, perhaps. It would seem to follow ultimate decisions must be left to the people who are familiar with those circumstances, know of the relevant changes and the resources available to meet them. Um, we must solve the, these sorts of problems by some form of decentralisation rather than a centralised approach, you know, run by regulator, run by government. And I think that's a, you know, a, a still a very salutary lesson to consider. Okay, thank you. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.